The, uh, the first thing you see in our notes this morning are the words, a grief observed. Now, that's a title that C.S. Lewis pirated and used for one of his really great books. And, uh, and I've stolen it again as the opening of our study in Ephesians chapter 6. Let me explain what I mean by a grief observed. I have been traveling a bit lately, and I have been very saddened to note the way people parent all around the world. Uh, it has just been heartbreaking. Much of the parenting that I have observed recently, recently has been a cause for grief. In fact, the only thing sadder than how people parent our children may be how children react to their parents. For example, I was in Frankfurt recently, and I was standing in line at a counter, and I observed this scenario. This German man was very angry about the seating of his mother on the flight we were about to get on. He was upset because, you ready for this? She was to be seated next to him. <laughs> he, was, he was just going off. Now, he was speaking in English. Poor mommy was there, and you could tell she was German, didn't understand a word of what he was saying, but he was demanding that she be moved somewhere else. Isn't that horrible? The only thing more horrible is what went through my mind. True confessions. As I watched this, I had two thoughts. One was, what a grief that is to observe. My second thought was, is there something wrong with her? What if they put her next to me? That was... <laughs> Parents and children can be so horrible. Uh, not long ago, I was teaching at the Dead Sea and had a little bit of downtime at this very nice resort uh, on the Jordanian side. And this Jordanian dad was with his daughter. They weren't in the Dead Sea where kids can get upset that salt gets in your eyes and stuff. No, they were in the pool. It was very nice. I mean, this kid's in the lap of luxury and she's crying. And I watched dad say, here, here, stop crying. Have some candy. Smart kid. She ate the candy. Then what do you think she did? started crying again. She was not dumb, right? I saw them again the next morning. We were checking out of that resort, and she was looking at her daddy and crying again. And I grieved for that little girl. I prayed for her because she seems destined to become a spoiled brat. She does not have a parent who loves her enough to bring her up properly. And of course, this is not just a problem out there. Many of our own trips to church this morning could easily be titled a grief observed, right? You and I find it very easy to note flaws in others, but we're certainly not perfect parents ourselves. At least I'm not. And we're not all that great as children either. Every single human being here is a child of someone. And I bet you that every one of us struggles with how, at least in some point, to appropriately respond to our parents. This whole parent-child thing is where the, the rubber of life really meets the road, isn't it? That's why God gave us Ephesians chapter 6, 1 through 4. In Ephesians 6, Paul's continuing his application of how to live out the Christian life. He specifically, in the beginning of chapter 6, targets our parenting and our reactions to our parents. Look up here. Let me show you a quick review of the book of Ephesians. First half of the book, 1 through 3, is all about the calling of the church in grace. In essence, we find out that in him, in Jesus, we are loved, all God's people said. Amen. Now, then the last half of the book, chapters 4 through 6, are about how to live out the conduct of the church by grace. In other words, how faith is lived. Because I am loved, I can live differently. Because of what God has done, I can do what he wants done. But, sadly, there may be no other area of life where Christians so readily forget chapters 1 through 3. For we just take the low road and just act like all the rest of the world in a food fight that is called home. By the way, I actually think that looks kind of fun. But, um, but it doesn't have to be that way. God has indwelt and empowered us such, chapters 1 through 3, that we don't have to be shoddy as kids or parents, chapter 4 through 6. Look at what God has in mind. Open your Bible, Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, because this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the beginning of a quote from Exodus 20, which is the first commandment with a promise so that it may go well with you and you may have a long life in the land. End of his quote. Fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Verse 1 lays out our truth in black and white, doesn't it? Children, obey your parents. It could not be more practical and clear. 
God commands kids to do whatever parents say. Anybody here ever had a parent say to you, because I said so? Raise your hand if you ever had a parent say that to you. Okay, well, according to Ephesians 6, that's not a bad answer, all right? And with that in mind, let's look at the specifics. What did the text say? Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Now, that prepositional phrase, in the Lord, what does it mean? What is it, what is it saying to us? Textually, there are two ways to take that phrase, in the Lord. And, and this is very rare, but it seems to be one of those times when, when the writer, the Apostle Paul, is meaning aspects of each. Meaning number one, in the Lord means they have authority over you as ones that the Lord put in power. The Bible is unequivocal. Parents are in charge. They are put there by the Lord. There is no election. There is no referendum. God has established parental authority. And by the way, that's not only for, for the parent-child relationship. The Bible makes it clear we are all to react to the Lord through the God-established authorities. We submit to all God-established authority. Um, uh, Titus chapter 3, the Apostle Paul's writing to a pastor about his congregation. He says, remind them to submit to rulers and authorities, to obey to be ready for every good work, to slander no one, to avoid fighting, to be kind, always showing gentleness to all people. All right, that means we obey the police and the tax assessor and our parents, right? In the Lord means that within God's sovereign rule, he has given a certain amount of authority over to human leaders. Now, the Old Testament was also very explicit about this issue. For example, to disobey your parents in Israel was considered equal to disobeying God. And it was a great evil that was to be removed from the people's midst. That's why Deuteronomy 21 has this. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who does not obey his father or mother and doesn't listen to them even after they discipline him, his father and mother are to take hold of him and bring him to the elders of his city, to the gate of his hometown. They're to say to the elders of his city, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He doesn't obey us. He's a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of his city will stone him to death. You must purge the evil from you, and Israel will hear and be afraid. Yeah, I bet they will. Aren't you glad that we live under the age of grace? All the kids in here, can I get an amen from all the children? Amen. We don't live under the law of Moses anymore. That law did its job. It's now fulfilled in Jesus. However, we still live in the Lord. And that means that the Old Testament principle is, is unchanged. Children, you are to obey your parents in the Lord. Now, meaning number two is you can only do this in the Lord. Obedience can't be achieved on your own. That's the other facet of what in the Lord means. And you want to know the main reason why you can't do this in your own strength? It's really simple. It's because your parents really are almost as dumb as you think they are. When does a dad joke become a dad joke? When it becomes a parent, right? Yeah, that, that terrible joke summarizes an entire childhood dynamic, right? The person who once made you laugh uproariously now makes you groan, right? And in kid logic, you just cannot obey someone that obtuse unless you let the Lord God Almighty help you, right? You can only do this in the Lord, Again, it's both. Parents represent God's authority, and you need God's help to obey these idiots whom he has put in charge. And you need to rely upon the Lord for power because this is, what's the last word, everybody? This is right. Right. Look up here, Zitz cartoon. This is from um, Jerry Scott and, and Jim Borgman's uh, teenage comic. Mom says, you still haven't completed your online traffic school? I have until the third, says Jeremy. Jared, today is the third, Jeremy. Oh, well, I have until midnight. It's 1045 now. Don't worry, Mom. I'll get it done. Mom takes his hand, drags him, carries him up the stairs, tap, tap, tap with his hand on the laptop, slam. And the kid says, see? <laughs> Let's be honest here within our broader family of Christ. How many of us ever acted like this to our parents? Raise your hand. You were ever, yeah, and the rest of you are probably lying. Psychologists call this passive aggression. And I find among Christian families, passive aggression is our most common form of rebellion. Most people who believe in Jesus are good kids. Um, we don't out and out defy very often. We don't act like that son in Deuteronomy 21 that often, but we do passively rebel like this son. In fact, we're very good at it. 
Such behavior needs to be called what it is. It is sin. Obedience is right. Disobedience is wrong. It, it, it's just wrong, kids. Now, in response, I know, I know what teenagers are thinking. You're, you're saying in your head, but Pastor Wayne, like, my parents are so bossy, and they don't, like, they don't even understand what I go through, right? I, I hear you. I do. I hear you. And in response, let me kindly and carefully speak the word of God to you. Get off your bottom Get up off your couch and obey your mother right now. How's that? All right. Why? Because this is right. Right and wrong have become very unwelcome words in our culture, but we need to love each other enough to shoot straight and be clear. We need to call things what they are, and obeying parents is right. Disobeying is wrong, period, paragraph, end of verse 1. Got it? Okay, now turn to the other side of your notes where we cover God's command to honor your father and mother, verses 2 and 3. The honor your father and mother from Exodus 20, and then Paul makes the comment, which is the first command with a promise, and then he continues the quote, so that it may go well with you and you may have a long life in the land. Remember, first step in studying the Bible is figuring out what God says. Then we need to ascertain what that means. It doesn't take x-ray vision to observe what it says here, honor your parents. But there is some struggle in figuring out what that means. The interpretation is less obvious. So let's start with the meaning of the word honor. The Greek verb is timao. And timao means to value, to revere something. Therefore, we're supposed to, to value, to revere our parents. I think there's a parallel passage that could help us understand. Um, 1 Timothy Chapter uh, 5, verse 3, support widows who are genuinely in need. Talking to the whole church here. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them learn to practice godliness toward their own family first and to repay their parents, for this pleases God. Now, support right here is the same word as honor in the Ephesians passage. It is timao. Everybody in the church is supposed to value widows. The passage goes on to say how we value is by helping them financially, which is something our church does through our benevolence offerings. But if a widow has a living family members who can help them, the family is first to pitch in because this is right in God's eyes. The whole church is to practice honor toward those to whom honor is due, but that never overrides the command for children and grandchildren to honor their parents. And notice the context in Timothy shows us what honor means. It means to put our time and money where our mouths are. God calls for us to value our parents so highly that we pay their way. To value them so highly that we help them with technology happily. We don't complain about grandma's tech foibles. We just help and say, I'm so glad I could assist. Think it through, folks. Every human in the world happily pays for the things that they value. Why did you buy that watch? Why did you buy that shirt? Because you, you thought they had value, right? You thought it was valuable, so you put your money there. That's how we are to act toward our parents. I know that brings up a big question, an important question that you're asking for some reason in your Alan Rickman imitation. Uh, Alan Rickman, does honor include obedience? Do I have to obey in order to honor Mr. Potter? Great question. Thank you, Alan, for asking. The answer is no. No, you do not have to obey. It's very, listen, it's very important we catch a distinction between verse 1 and verse 2. Children, those not yet grown, are covered in verse 1, and they are to obey. Grown people who are still children of their parents, but they are no longer under their authority, grown folks are to value, they are to honor, but they may or may not obey. There is a serious demarcation between verse 1 and verse 2. Think about the author. Paul, the human author of this, was a Hebrew there's a reason the Hebrews would not too long after this develop a system of the bar mitzvah and the bat mitzvah where a teenage boy or girl had a coming of age ceremony where they became officially adults. They became adults. The Hebrews saw this was once a child in authority of the parents, but then that child has to hold the Torah 
the, the Word of God has to memorize sections of the Torah and recite them to prove, the whole reason for that is to show that they are now directly under the authority of God and His Word. They are no longer under the authority of their parent, right? This is really significant. They go from verse 1 to verse 2. I once met a famous Christian musician who never left verse 1. Very talented guy. You would know his name, but he makes no decision in life. This guy's 40 years old, makes absolutely no decision unless his parents approve of it. He gets their authority for everything. The Apostle Paul would be appalled, <laughs> pun intended. Um, God says, grow up. Honor, honor your daddy, but don't live like a child obeying him. Some of you men and women may be under this ridiculous yoke. Cast it off. You adults do not have to do what your mommy says, period. End of verse 1. On to verse 2. Honor, yes. Obey, not necessarily. Now, I know I'm going to get mail this week that says, I'm an adult, but, but my mother or father make me feel so guilty whenever I don't obey their wishes. This is a really painful problem. And, and, and especially those of you, we've got, we've got people from all over the world that are part of our church, and, and many more, we love you, who are studying with us overseas right now. And a number of you grew up in shame-based cultures. And this is very difficult. Uh, some of you Americans won't understand it, but when you grow up in a shame-based culture, this is a very, very big part of life. Please take yourself to the authority of God and his word. It is God whom you serve. You are under the authority of his scripture alone. Just because you are a human being's child doesn't mean you should remain childish. What it says is to honor parents. That means we value them, which elicits a second question. And this is a really good question as well. How do you honor someone who is dishonorable? There are many people who, who have at least one parent they would describe as dishonorable. Let me just tell you about two of my friends. I have one friend, precious friend of mine. This guy grew up not only in a home with a deadbeat dad, who left, abandoned the family when he was very young. A father never gave him anything in his life, except when he was an adult, his dad mailed him a pair of filthy, torn up blue jeans and said, here, in the note, it said, here, don't say I never gave you anything. That was it. Another friend of mine grew up with a mom who was not only abusive, she abused him, but she also rejected him so completely that when that woman died, she died at 82 years old and she was quite wealthy. In her will, when it was read, she left him $1. One dollar. That's worse than nothing, isn't it? How in, in heaven's name can you honor someone who is that dishonorable? It's a great question. Let me walk you through it this way. Nowhere in Timao, does it suggest you have to admire someone in order to honor them? With God's help in the Lord, we can honor anyone. Here's the key. See them through Jesus' eyes. That horrible father I talked about, that terrible mother, does God love them, yes or no? Did Jesus Christ, Son of God, become human and die on a human cross to pay for their sins so that if they would only turn from their wickedness and trust him, they could have everlasting life. Did that happen, yes or no? Amen. Yes. Okay, so, so everyone is valued by God, even wretches like us. So even if your parent rejects Jesus the Savior, even if he or she is awful, even if obeying them would be a ridiculous violation of God's word, you can still honor them by valuing them the way Jesus does. Amen? Okay, that's what it means. Now let's look at what it achieves. Go back to verse 3. Oop, too far. Go back to verse 3. Uh, so that it may go well with you and you may have a long life in the land. Now, take your mind back to what Moses said. The Old Testament talks a lot about this. I've pulled out the three major ones. The first you see is according to Moses. Uh, this is what it achieves according to Moses. Now, remember, Moses said you're to take that one who is disobedient, just absolutely rebellious, and have them stoned. Uh, these are a bunch of elders from a number of different churches that were all on a 
trip where I was teaching in Israel one time, and I gathered us all together. Skylar, here I got us all and uh, put us in the gate of the city. That's, uh, that's actually Megiddo. We're in a city gate at Megiddo, and I read this scripture to them. I said, now look really fierce, like you're about to stone somebody. I don't think we pulled it off, but, um, <laughs> but that, was, that was the idea. There's also a positive aspect to Moses' law. Don't only look at that part of Deuteronomy. Um, Look up here, Deuteronomy 5, verse 16. Honor your father and mother as the Lord your God has commanded you so that you may live long and you may prosper in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Before letting the children of Israel go into the promised land, Moses takes them through a, a repeat of the Ten Commandments. And notice how God has him phrase it here. There's this blessing of long life on the person who honors. Now, that rule is limited to the Mosaic law. Nonetheless, the Apostle Paul picks up on that precept of blessing, and he says, hey, this command is not just negative. It had a blessing attached, too. Your time on earth is affected by how you treat with mom and dad. According to Moses, there is a blessing to life. Now, later, King David builds on that. Uh, According to David, there's also a legacy, an inheritance for somebody who honors his parents. Psalm 37, David is really old. And Psalm 37 is his last words to his children and grandchildren, right? And he's speaking these wonderful things. I wish we had time to read it all about God's inheritance, but I'll leave that for your time alone with the Lord. For now, let's just look at verses 25 and 26. Join me on the underlined parts, Psalm 37. I have been young. I'm kidding. We won't read it like that. I have been young and now I am old, your turn, yet I have not seen the righteous abandoned or his children begging for bread. He, the righteous person, is always generous, always lending, and his children are a blessing, a blessing. In general, the person who does what is right, that's what righteous means, rears kids who follow him in righteousness. Their children become a blessing. What does honoring parents bring? Well, according to Paul, it's right. It brings righteousness when you honor your parents, whether they're honorable or not. According to Moses, it brings long, blessed life. According to David, it brings a legacy. And according to Solomon, the third one we're going to look at, it brings satisfaction and favor. Listen to Solomon. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. My child, never forget the things I have taught you. Store my commands in your heart. If you do this, you will live many years and your life will be satisfying. Never let loyalty and kindness leave you. Tie them around your neck as a reminder. Write them deep within your heart. Then you will find favor with both God and people and you will earn a good reputation. Solomon goes on to talk about uh, Moses and David's points as well. Long life, a legacy in the land. But his main issue is success. Success before God and people. Listen to wisdom from mom and dad and you'll make good choices. You'll have good friends. You will be satisfied in righteousness. Anybody here ever, don't raise your hand, but you ever ignore good advice that your mom or dad gave to you? Yeah, me too. I I have those scars. Solomon was right. Unless your parent is advising you against God's word, you do very well to listen. All right, kids, at last, what you've been waiting for, verse 4, fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Parents, two commands for you. Don't exasperate, do bring them up. First, don't stir up anger, don't exasperate your kids. There are two main aspects to biblical parenting. Biblical parenting is actually very simple. It's just not simple to do it. There are two things we're called to do. Discipline and chastisement. Those are the two words scripture uses. Discipline is teaching and training someone. Chastisement is punishment and correction. Now, both discipline and chastisement will very likely anger your child. That's just part of life. The presence of anger in your child does not mean you are parenting poorly in that moment. Just think, as an adult, do you particularly love training? Do you really enjoy being corrected and punished? Yes or no? No, kids are no different. Nobody likes it. The problem's not with anger. The problem comes when we foment anger, when we stir it up, when we provoke anger in our kids, right? I want to show you a video of a parent who purposefully tried to exasperate her child. She tried to stir up anger. Take a look at this. So you know how I put you to bed last night? Uh Uh-huh. Well, I got really hungry and I ate all of your candy. I'm sorry. You're the 
just joking. You didn't eat them, my candy. I did. I was really hungry. Well, I didn't show my room. I know, but I was really hungry and I didn't have any other food. I'm really sorry. Well, you should eat some food for me from in here. Oh, I'm really sorry. We need to. Mommy, I'm not, I'm not mad at you. It's okay. What a sweet boy. First, he called her bluff. Then he made a very legitimate argument about all the food in the fridge. And then he forgave the atrocity of someone eating his candy. She did not deserve that response. But I think it's likely a sign that except for that evil prank, she's raising that boy well, wouldn't you say? Loving pranks aside, we parents are not supposed to stir up anger in our kids, period. We don't provoke them to anger, either in discipline or in chastisement. The last time I taught this passage was at a men's retreat. And I had a number of guys come up to talk afterwards. I went back to my room and I wrote down some of the things they said. They were, they were really good. Uh, I wrote down three things that guys said in response to, to this text. One fellow said, but the only time they obey is when I scream at them or belittle them with sarcasm. Another guy said, Wayne, you just don't understand. You don't know how my kid pushes my buttons. And then this was my favorite. One guy said, I have to tape the kid to the wall to get a minute's piece. And I think he was joking. I hope so. Regardless, this was my reply each time. I looked at them and I said, big, fat, hairy deal. Your child pushes your buttons. Shocking. It's a child. Of course it does. That doesn't mean you have to be childish and do the same. You think your children won't obey unless you exasperate them or yell at them. That is not true. That, in no situation is that true. You have just settled for the laziest kind of parenting. It's effective, but it's horrible. Talk to one of our next-gen staff. We've got a bunch of wonderful next-gen staff around here, and they will talk to you about strategies where you can do what needs to be done. You can hold your child to obedience, which they need, it is right, without sinning yourself. I, I'm not meaning to talk down to you at all. I understand the struggle. I've, I live it. Occasionally, I find that I slip into what I call coaching mode. And I'll look at my children and I begin to treat them as if they were members of one of my old wrestling teams, right? They never respond well to that. They've never responded well. And I finally figured out why. Because it is exasperating to have someone treat you outside of their proper role. I am not their coach. I am their father. And I've watched other men and women do the same thing. They treat their kids like little clones of them or, or as business partners or employees, Right? It never works. It is unhealthy for the child. A child should be treated like a child. Appropriate to his or her age, a child should be treated with dignity and love, even when, especially when that child is being disciplined or chastised. The world gets it all wrong. For years, people spanked for everything, and they usually did so in anger. That is very exasperating, uh, exasperating for the child, isn't it? Some of you grew up with that. Talk about stirring up anger. Now, today, the current trend is the other extreme, to never discipline and certainly never chastise, right? You can put whatever fancy title you want on it. Passive parenting is bad parenting, period. Passive parenting is unscriptural. The outcome is always the same. Passive parenting makes for undisciplined children. I feel so sorry for kids today. The, the world won't discipline you and yet somehow expects you to feel loved and valued. <laughs> it's a complete disconnect. It doesn't work. Children aren't stupid. Look, when the authorities are passive, the kids know. Well, that means either the authority is blind or doesn't care, right? Those are the only options. And I'll tell you, there is nothing as angering as being under adults who just don't care about you. When you, when you train or teach me that is discipline, even when you, when you correct me or punish me, chastisement, if you do it in love, you're showing me as your child that you care about me and I am valued. 
Dads and moms, respect your kids. Respect them enough to demand first-time obedience. It trains them for self-discipline. It is right. But respect them enough to do so without stirring up anger in them. Is that hard? Sure it is. That's why you can only do it, back to our wonderful prepositional phrase, in the Lord. Would you like a practical example? Last time I taught this, somebody sent me a note with a, with a picture attached. I think it's a, it's a great example for us. Here's a practical way to live this out. Um, guy wrote me and said, Wayne, most of America's populace thinks it's very improper to spank children. So my spouse and I have tried other methods to control our kids when they have one of those moments. One that we found very effective is for me to just take the child for a car ride and talk. They usually calm down and stop misbehaving after our little car ride together. In case you would like to use the technique, I've included a photo below from one of our sessions with our son. It's very effective. And this was the photo that was attached. Um, if you can't see, uh, it's a kid photoshopped, praise God, kid hanging on for dear life on the outside of a car going 99 and 35 mile an hour zone. All right. Seriously, let's get to the second command of parents. Do bring them up. This is also divided into two parts. Bring them up in the training of the Lord. Now, that's just a subset of the Great Commission. The Great Commission is teaching people to, to follow Jesus, doing his commands, teach them to observe everything I've commanded you. And remember, Jesus says, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Notice Paul didn't say in Ephesians, bring him up the way your old man did. Does he say that? Yes or no? Did Jesus say, teach them to observe everything commanded by Dr. Tripp? Did he? He didn't say, teach them to observe everything commanded by Tim Kimmel or Mrs. Clarkson or James Dobson. No, wonderful as those people may be, God says, bring them up in the training of whom, everybody? The Lord. Training involves discipline, including the spiritual disciplines. God says you need to teach your kids how to become self-disciplined followers of Jesus. That includes disciplines like being at church. And it starts with you. <laughs> I cannot effectively train what I don't practice. As they so often do, the writers of the Babylon Bee pointedly expose our folly here. The Babylon Bee is a satirical site. They sent this one. Local father Trevor Michelson, 48, and his wife Carrie are reeling after discovering that after 12 years of steadily taking their daughter to church every Sunday, they didn't have a more pressing sporting commitment, which was at least once every three months. She no longer demonstrates the strong quarterly commitment to the faith they raised her with. Man, that's great phraseology, even if it is bad grammar. Trevor Michelson was simply stunned at the revelation. I just don't understand it. Almost every single time there was a rain dot game or a break between school and club team seasons, we had Janie in church. It was at least once per quarter. And aside from that one tournament in 2018, we never missed an Easter. Obviously, it was a priority in our family. I just don't get where her spiritual apathy is coming from. <laughs> the answer to that tragedy is parents who take seriously their responsibility to bring up children in the discipline of the Lord. One other thing to note about the training of the Lord, it involves fellowship with messy people. The, the New Testament reveals that Jesus' followers, from the very first 12 to the millions that would come, they are all still sinful. They still have the flesh. That means that Jesus' training occurs in the smelly, sinful flesh pot that is the local church, which means people are going to hurt your feelings and your little baby's feelings. And that's okay. That's actually good because it's part of the training of the Lord. Quickly, part two of bringing them up. Do it in the instruction of the Lord. Here's another part of Moses' uh, commands to Israel in Deuteronomy. These words that I'm giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Jewish parents are expected to take seriously their responsibility to teach the instructions of the Lord. Again, we're not under Moses' fulfilled law, but the idea translates directly to Christians of any and every background. This is our responsibility. God's word is to be so embedded in my soul that discussing it is a natural part of my family life. Christian parent, I've got three options. Really, I've got three options. I can ignore my calling to train our kids. I can just ignore it. I can abdicate my role to others. I can go to the church or the school group or whomever, et cetera, et cetera, and say, here, he's your problem, right? Or I can responsibly use the resources that we have in the Holy Spirit and Scripture and the church and et cetera. And look, that third part does not, that third option does not have to be tedious or legalistic. Moses says it should be natural. 
It's part of your normal coming and going in life. Family training, Bible devotions, talking about Scripture should be built into your family rhythm. All right, let's deal with some practical objections. First one, this is the one I hear most often. It, 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 I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. I have a little family devotion, and I just will look at them and say nothing. We, most of us understand. I, t- I tell you what, from my own life, I have never seen, I don't think I've ever seen a human being as nervous as my dad, who was never nervous about anything. But when I was about 12, a preteen, he decided that we needed to have, he'd come to Christ, I did, we needed to have family devotions. And he was scared out of his mind. And it didn't matter. It didn't matter what he said. I don't remember what he said. I just remember being so touched, even as a stinky 12-year-old, being so touched. That, not that you're stinky 12-year-olds. I, I was. Um, so touched that he just cared. He just cared enough to try. And that was what matters. Now, if you want specific suggestions on what to say, how to do an age-appropriate family devotion, you could talk to any of our staff. But two of them uh, agreed to be set aside specifically for this. Right, Lori Franklin, who's the head of FB Kids, or Dean Snowball, who's our... Uh, our senior high director, and, and they will help you so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Objection number two, people will say, yeah, okay, we would have this be part of our family life, this training, this, this discipline, but it'll be boring. Yes, yes, it probably will, because you're kind of boring. <laughs> so what? They're supposed to learn from you, not find you the most fascinating human who ever lived. They got over that a long time ago. I don't know how to tell you this. (laughs) Besides, a little boredom is actually good for your kids. If you have a short prayer and Bible time, do you realize that may be the only time in their entire week that they have to sit and think and quiet? Also, this is really intriguing, being bored together can actually force people into deeper relationships, which is one of the reasons we live in a world that is so lonely. Ted Cluck wrote about this brilliantly uh, just last week. Dr. Cluck said, we don't have much of an opportunity to be bored together in, in that we carry our televisions, our stereos, our classrooms, and all of our conversations with us on our phones. We can curate and self-promote and movie make and side hustle all while standing in line at the supermarket. We never have to be bored. As a result, we're probably very productive But we're also, if anecdotal evidence, as well as everything written in the past decade is to be believed, we're also very lonely, close quote. So let's not fear boredom. It it may be one of the only ways we develop real relationships. Objection number three, people will say, I don't want to get trapped in a rut. The answer, don't. Okay, look for teachable moments all along the way, just like Moses said. When my kids were home, we only had devotions about once a week, usually early on Monday mornings. But, but we were always looking for teachable moments of scriptural instruction all along the way. We could go on, but you get the point. Children, obey your parents. It's right. All offspring, honor your parents. Parents, disciple without stirring up anger. Parents, raise them up in spiritual disciplines and instruction. That's how we live out who we are, Ephesians 4 through 6. That's how we can be holy at home. Got it? All right, pray with me, please. Let's pray. Father, it started within the Lord, and, and that's really where we have to begin. I pray for myself and my brothers and sisters in Christ that we will be empowered by the Holy Spirit of God who indwells us in the Lord. And I pray for anyone who is studying the Bible with me today that has never trusted Jesus as Savior. Please do what you do. Stir them up and bring them to the truth that they are indeed sinful because they are just like all of us are. And they are separated from holy God. But you made a way that we can turn from our sin and instead trust Jesus as Savior. We can believe in him who died on the cross to pay for for our sins. And who rose from the grave conquering death so we could be with him in everlasting life. Friend, if you have never done so, trust Jesus as Savior right now. Turn to him and receive him alone as your salvation.
If you trusted Jesus and you're in the auditorium, would you raise your hand? Everybody's still praying, but just raise your hand. I want to rejoice with you. Online, if you'll say something to your host, they want to praise God with you as well. Good. Lord, I pray for all of these, the ones who today are brand new believers in Jesus, those of us who have been such for some time, that we will be in Jesus in how we act so that we do live this out, that we are wholly at home. It's so rare and so beautiful. In Jesus' name, amen.